welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, we're talking with Patrick Danaher from the University of Southern Queensland about Sustainable Development Goal 4, which aims to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education for all by 2030. Patrick is a Doctor of Philosophy and a full-time university academic since 1991. He is a Professor in Education Research in the School of Linguistics and is the Acting Dean of the Graduate Research School in the Research and Innovation Division at the University of Southern Queensland. He's also a published author on a variety of education research subjects, in particular building and enhancing educational capacity, educational innovation, and maximizing learning outcomes for children. Welcome to Thrive, Patrick. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Great to be here. That's great. Now, can you tell our audience exactly what we mean when we're talking about SDG 4 by inclusive and equal access to education for all and why that's so important for global sustainability? The answer is not simple or straightforward or easy. In fact, SDG 4 has chosen two of the most complex adjectives applying to formal education, and that is inclusive and equitable. So perhaps we could spend a little bit of time unpacking each of those, if that's all right. Of course, yes. Yes, thanks so much. All right. So if we think about inclusive, that's a relatively recent development. But if we think about inclusion more generally, that's clearly about working with different groups, different individuals, different communities to have a shared goal, a common understanding of the world. And that's admirable, but it's very hard work. It's a bit like uh, in in the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel. We had all of those multiple <laughs> languages. Of course, the different and languages, and we couldn't communicate to build the tower anymore. Yeah, Exactly, that's yeah. right. So the word inclusive in an educational sense and in a social sense also refers to the fact that there are particularly groups of learners who have different kinds of learning needs. And those needs are not necessarily contradictory of one another, but they're sufficiently different that if you're trying to organise a school or a, you know, an education system, it has to be very broad to cater to those different educational needs. I and suppose so- when, you, when you look at it like that as well, where what we mean by education is going to mean different things to those different groups as well and, and what they think is important to share and, and carry on. So that's exactly. going to be yes. very complicated. Exactly. <laughs> and and just as one example, I, I read a paper recently about migrant communities and, and uh, migrant languages, which it might be, you know, Italian or wherever the, the, they've come from, from overseas. And within those communities, different people have different views. Should they focus only, in this case, Australia, only on English, or should they retain their their traditional language as well? And it was very interesting that the views about language inclusion varied uh, from individual to individual. So some older people said, no, we've got to maintain you know, the, the original mother tongue. Other older people said, no, forget that. These, these young people won't need that in the new society. That's sort of like the balancing goal of education is you want to preserve culture and pass down traditions and, and share that history, but you also want to prepare children for the world that they're going to live in. That's really insightful, Rebecca. And I think that one of the consequences of that is the importance of developing individual and community literacy and literacy in a broader sense, clearly about being able to reflect on our own development, on our own experiences, on issues like sustainability in order to develop an informed approach and, and a set of understandings. And so part of inclusive and equitable quality education that SDG is focused on is developing those kinds of really rigorous systematic understandings in individuals and also in communities. Do you think then that we should be changing how we educate people, like critical Uh, thinking and, and interacting with the world? The purpose of schooling, and there are some people who say the purpose of schooling is employment, is preparation for employment, mm-hmm. development of skills and, and attitudes and so on to 
put people into the workforce. Um, and there's truth in that. You know, it would be unfortunate if people graduated from school unable skills, to, yeah. to, to apply for jobs. But equally, if that's the only thing that they do, that's really limiting because it means that their mindsets are geared towards jobs as opposed to living, you know, working to live as opposed to living to work, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. So uh, I think partly what we're talking about is a mindset, isn't it? You know, a set of understandings. Part of SDG 4, of course, is promoting lifelong learning opportunities. Mm-hmm. And I often think that as well as the practical, if you like, behavioural kinds of things that we do, you know, in terms of learning to turn up to work on time or to uh, to respect other people in our team or whatever it might be, it's also a disposition. It's an openness to learning and a love of learning. What are some of the problems that our current educational system is running into? One of those, and again, there's been a lot written about this, is the concern from from government, and it's an understandable concern, are we getting value for money in terms of all the funding we put into education? And this is not just um, uh, Australia. This is certainly the Western world, the developed world, and so on. And so, and that's perfectly understandable. You know, taxpayers, the, the uh, I'm not sure the figures, but the investment in education is huge in in many countries, uh, often uh, second to health, for instance, uh, understandably. So as a consequence of that, we've got uh, in Australia, we've got NAPLAN, the national testing at particular year levels. And internationally, we've got PISA and we've got TIMS and we've got a number of these uh, ratings, ranking systems rather. Now, the problem with that is that they provide a, a often a decontextualized you know, so they've got a snapshot of, of test results, but that doesn't really necessarily give you good information about what people no. are <laughs> have no, learned. That, that's <laughs> true, and and exactly, and also there is uh, there is commentary around the the way that the tests are set up. They favour um, st- students with certain kinds of backgrounds, so people from wealthier backgrounds where they're more likely to read you know, at an earlier age, but also certain kinds of learning. They're predicated on seeing the world and responding in assessment terms. So many, just as a a very quick side example, many years ago, I did work with the show families, the fairground families who travel around. Now, in previous generations, for particular reasons, um, they were very successful at running a fairground, but they had tended to avoid school and have interrupted schooling. Mm-hmm. So when they got their own school, they were fantastic. In terms of SDG4, very inclusive, very e- equitable, very set up, focused on lifelong learning. But then a previous Queensland government shut down the school, partly on the basis of, uh, oh, their NAPLAN results are poor. Well, their NAPLAN results were poor, not because of the school, but because of the, you know, the decades previously. So you can't turn that around quickly. And it, it's not appropriate to you, as you said before, Rebecca, a moment ago. Uh, that's that's uh, what would we say? That's a, almost like a blunt instrument. It's uh, you know, it's it's not a finely detailed or very ac- individually accurate uh, summation of someone's learning ability. Right, of course, yeah, because you're only you're choosing what to to test, and of course, in the past, I believe we've had like um, IQ tests and things like that have come under criticism for. Um, being more developed for a specific culture um, and education level rather than being a true test of of someone's capacity for intelligence. Exactly. That's right, yes. Um, Now, just stepping back a bit, you mentioned government funding um, being quite high for education. However, it's also true that there is a lot of government funding that goes to private schools. Do you think there are ethical concerns with that? I don't really have a position on that, except I have a view of this, I guess. Uh, What that represents to me is a a diversity of approaches to education. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, to me, I put that in the same basket as, say, having Catholic education system, but also having Muslim uh, schooling and other, other, uh, I know that 
partly what we're talking about with private is not so much the religious based, but it's. Um, there is a know. lot of religious based private schools, yes. though. That's yes. definitely true. Do you think that there's maybe a disproportionate, like there's a lot more Christian or Catholic um, private schools than there are other religions? That's certainly the case. And that reflects Australia's social history and so on. But I guess that also makes the point with regard to SGD4 that certainly when I look at their mission statement, and you read that out before, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. I think diversity is key there. In other words, it's not one size fits all. It's not even a small number of sizes. It's um, vive la différence. It's having lots of different ways in which that might work, partly because, as you also highlighted, Rebecca, the importance of different contexts. So what is feasible and, and so on in one context is very different in another. So, for instance, with as we know, with the SDG4, some of the goals relate to free primary and secondary schooling. And some of the countries in, say, in sub-Saharan Africa and so on have actually made, you know, significant ground in improving those kinds of things. Whereas in Australia, you know, we almost take that for granted in our country. We're focused on... We certainly do, yeah. (laughs) other, Other kinds of things. So, again, it's a very worthwhile goal. It's when you look behind the goal and how does that work in this country or in this state or in this community... Uh, that right. that we start to see some of that diversity. Is there a difference in educational outcomes between public and privately funded schools? Well, the, uh, certainly the private schools would say that that's the case. Um, <laughs> the, that doesn't again, mean this, that's true. <laughs> no, that's right. Again, this is not specifically my field, but my understanding is that actually across the board, uh, that the outcomes, the those schooling outcomes, are, are very comparable. And the the point of difference is actually more uh, often the kinds of connections and networks that private schools pride themselves on, you know, developing those other kinds of capital, social capital and cultural capital and that kind of thing. So I see that as actually indicating that despite all the pressures, government schooling or state schooling actually does pretty well. That's excellent to hear. Now, SDG4 also talks about access to lifelong learning opportunities, which you mentioned earlier. Why is education important for all ages? Fundamentally, learning is living and living is learning. And if if we stop learning, we're really not living in, in, in really profound ways, I think. But more importantly than that, it it's the notion that if we think about living as as drawing on our own agency and our autonomy, uh, as making a contribution, as as learning about the world and then sharing that learning with others and so on. That's actually saying that it's part of being a citizen or a member of a community that we have a responsibility to do that kind of ongoing lifelong learning, whatever form that might take. So some cases that's university of the third age for retired people and so on. Um, uh, But in other ways, really importantly, that's the crucial work that grandparents do with grandchildren and families. When they yeah, teach, offering you know, like, you know, helping grandchildren out or helping exactly. the kids out by babysitting. Yeah, of course. And, and obviously that the world is constantly changing. So if you're not learning, you, yes. you're it, not it, able to live in the present. No, that, that's exactly right. And also I think it highlights the point that learning is crucial to, you know, we have to use these words a little bit cautiously, I get, but, but for instance, as being part of a democracy that it's one of those responsibilities of being a citizen that you make a contribution, that when we vote, we make an informed decision. We don't just close our eyes and <laughs> pick one name out. <laughs> or, or don't just pick a team and only have a... Yeah, you, you, it is, I think, a very important thing. Um, however, there is a problem in the, the world today as well. Like, How does education counter the amounts of misinformation and media saturation that is out there. Excellent point. And I think that goes back to the point that we were talking about before about literacy. And literacy in the sense, not in the narrow sense of uh, reading to write in a narrow kind of way, but rather literacy understood as having our own framework for understanding the world uh, and that develops over time. But we use that framework to test out these things that are everywhere, 
uh, on TV and social media, uh, in other media, uh, uh, absolutely everywhere. Um, and so that we have some kind of an informed foundation for making decisions that that person is saying that why are they saying that how credible is that what are the effects of that and well that, yeah we have to all have have a shared understanding of what reality is don't we to yes. be able to come to any kind of meaningful decisions because if we don't you know it, we just exactly and yelling and past each other exactly and i i think with the tribalism that we see uh, setting again in the developed world setting the united states and i think there's evidence of that here, exactly that, that sense that we've got different tribes shouting out and yeah. not listening, not listening to the other groups at all. And so if you've got younger people, but also older people who are often quite frightened of the way that the world is becoming, uh, how do we make sense of that? And I, I think that part of being informed is that capacity to listen. You know, it's not easy to listen to points of view. That sort of accept get. new information and, and be willing yeah. to change. That's right. Or at least have some foundation, some criteria. Uh, and again, you know, Thrive being the single source of truth about actually really controversial questions is a crucial public education contribution. Well, it's about, you know, for us and I suppose me personally as well, it's about using that scientific method and, and having that evidence-based approach to understanding the world. If you don't have that grounding, then you can't ever really agree on what truth is. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. How much time can any one person or any organisation spend on different points of view? You know, so what I'm thinking is on the one hand, we might, we might want to connect with uh, other viewpoints and try to understand why people have come to think that way and so on. But there might come a point where we say, again, Tower of Babel, we're actually, there's no shared understanding. We have yeah. different ways of seeing the world and never the twain shall meet. Um, and that's a practical, it's partly about sustainability. How much time do we devote to different viewpoints, trying to understand seeing if, if we can learn anything from other viewpoints, which we should always try to do. But we might get to a point where we say, look, this is just never going to reach to any kind of uh, resolution or coming together. Yeah, I think that that's the case. I mean, you certainly see things like um, the flat earthers, people who yep. believe that the world is flat, and you can have a conversation with them, but at some point they simply don't accept the evidence that you accept, and that's... You know, it's, it's a sticking point that you can't move past. Most definitely. And so um, I, one thing, the other thing we didn't cover in terms of the keywords is equitable. And again, mm -hmm. this is a really interesting term, isn't it? Equity uh, not being the same as equality and that kind of thing. And uh, of course, the general point is that there are different journeys to the same destination. And so in some cases, that means giving additional resources to some groups of learners because they don't have those, such as uh, students with special educational needs, for instance. Um, in other cases, it's, you know, more broadly, socially, it's about uh, things like quota systems or incentives or uh, other kinds of ways of, uh, I suppose, levelling the playing field as much as possible. Accepting that the, the playing field has not been level for, you know, from the start. You can't treat everybody equally from the beginning because people aren't starting out from equal positions and you have to recognise the reality of that and make That's appropriate right. accommodations. Yes, exactly. You know, in some countries in Africa and Asia, for instance, very practically that means uh, public transport questions or pr provided right, transport. Right, of course, yeah. You know, to, for people living in rural areas and or boarding schools or or those kinds of things. Um, it also means paying teachers sufficient that they see themselves as as professional people. I've I've read in a number of different countries, uh, particularly in countries where there is political instability, where a teacher might well be trying, I'm sure, trying their best, but it's one of two or three jobs that they've got. Right, of course, because they're not families. earning enough. And yeah. yeah, I have heard that there is at the moment a, a worldwide teacher shortage because of teachers being underpaid and having to do things like buy their own resources to to yeah. help um, give to children and, and stuff like that. So do you think that we 
as a society are undervaluing education. Definitely, yes, uh, and including in Australia. And I know most parents are very uh, supportive of teachers and so on, but there are certainly cases where teachers feel threatened by parents. And again, um, often that's diffused when there's a, a shared conversation. Obviously, some parents are going to view the teachers as brainwashing their children because yes. they have different values to them. And yeah, so there's definitely an issue there. A moment ago, you, you mentioned like uh, rural communities and stuff like that. And we've actually seen with COVID and lockdowns that we can have remote learning and if that's an effective tool that we can use. Uh, do you think we can use the, that technology um, and, and use those resources for enhancing education in rural areas? I know there are some people, you know, technophobes and very concerned about that more broadly, but I, I'm much more of a technophile without going over, overboard. But if we think about, for instance, with remote surgery, for instance, it's right, the, yes. the technologies are uh, extraordinary. And at universities, certainly in Australia and other countries like Canada and many other countries, we've had distance education, open learning, online education for a very long time. And, and I think what COVID showed was that that can happen. Um, in Canada, certainly one of the provinces of Canada, they actually called it emergency learning because they had such little notice before COVID hit. Um, so I think it just says the obvious there that you need time for planning, you need the provision of resources and, and so on. But fundamentally, it's the relationships that are built up uh, between teacher and students and between students themselves. Uh, and that can be done just as effectively uh, it, online and in other ways. I, I'm sure that we've both experienced teaching in a face-to-face -face environment that was boring, alienating, you know, disengaging. We can be yeah. just as disengaging face-to-face -face as, <laughs> as we can online, and it works the other way. But we, so for instance, I'm working with a couple of people who work in distance education in Queensland. One of the things that is that really works well there, they have extension days, I think they call them, where basically for a week, the, the kids from all different schools gather in one place, a, you know, a central place, and they meet face to face. And that's the only time in the year that they do that. But uh, And they've built up relationships online uh, over time. And that kind of bridging between the online and the face to face social presence really works well at building those connections. I personally found that I was able to thrive uh, using distance education far more than I could in with in-person education. And part of that was the flexibility that was afforded by it, being able to, you know, I didn't have to attend lectures at specific times. I could watch them on my own time. So do you think that that also helps um, make education education more flexible to those with different learning needs yes absolutely Rebecca and and I agree with you and and also in terms of the efficient use of resources it makes them more widely available of course know. yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's that's an economic benefit from that point of view and I agree I, I think you know you're a good example self-disciplined self-motivated well organized you're able to use those kinds of skills uh, to make a success out of that environment. And I think that there are those fundamentals for success that are there, whether you're learning face-to-face -face or online or via distance or whatever, regardless of, of how old you are. Now, I just want to talk about equal access to, to education. Research tells us that there are around 400 million children around the world that are missing critical literacy milestones, so they can't read a story by age 10. Goodness me, that's huge, isn't it? That's an enormous <laughs> number of people who are let down by the system. I think sometimes the, the language of instruction is not the language at home, that kind of oh, thing. Oh, so there's like language barriers that they have to yes. cross. Yes. Yeah. And from that point of view, you know, a, a narrow view of literacy, of being able to read and write in the formal or majority language of a culture ignores those cultural differences and and so on. And sometimes the way that that's approached to some education systems really engage with the parents and the community to say, what do these young people already know through their families, through their communities, right. as a way of 
making literacy part of meaning making, you know, against the backdrop. But sometimes that's not done for various reasons. And what it means is, is that the, the view that the child comes as a blank slate with knowing nothing, and it's a deficit view of literacy learning that said, oh, goodness me, we'll have to fill them up with knowledge that is sometimes taught in a way that is decontextualized that just doesn't make any sense. So it's like yeah. learning a foreign language, but there's no way to practice the foreign language outside of the class. There's actually um, experts who, who are saying that to provide basic education to everyone in the world, uh, it would only cost an extra $26 billion a year. Do you think that that's true, that it's just a matter of money, or do you think that it's a more complicated and, and nuanced issue? Sadly, I think it's more nuanced and more complicated than that. And that's partly when we look at countries that are undergoing coups and you know, totalitarian regimes and so on, where actually the government of the day has a vested interest in not educating their young people or in, or in educating only a small elite group who are going to be of service to that, that government and the ideology that goes with that. Do you think that that could also be true partly in the, the Western world? That there is oh. benefit to be had for the wealthy to keep poor people undereducated? Yes, I, I mean, that's one of the critiques of capitalism, isn't it? Exactly that, <laughs> that it's about ordering people into different social classes. Like in England, for instance, the 11 plus was really about segregating people at that very young age in terms of grammar schools versus technical schools in other right. kinds of schooling. And that's changed. But fundamentally, the underlying things, schools are, are still in many ways a sorting mechanism. And they set the life trajectories for future work and, the, and those people's children in turn. I, I do think that one of the things in Australia anyway is that certainly in education, I'm very impressed by the notion of pathways that, you know, as an individual, you make some choices when you're 13, 14, 15 about what subjects you do in year 11 and 12. And then if you go to TAFE, do an apprenticeship, go to uni or whatever. But sometimes people decide later, that was the wrong choice, or here's a new <laughs> it's option. A lot to choose at 13, isn't of it? Of <laughs> course, absolutely. And I don't want to idealise it, but I do have the sense, certainly in educa educationally, that we recognise that as a nation. And, and other countries might do that too, but um, the notion that you go, you're going down one path and, and there are, at certain points, there are points of intersection where you can change, like yeah. a, a railway system, you know, and you say, uh, you, you go along to other paths. It's not as easy as it should be, but things like recognition of prior learning, you know, uh, is actually very helpful, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah make, absolutely. Make a difference, yeah. I know that uh, with degrees such as nursing, for example, you can get work as an enrolled nurse, so that you get practical experience along with the more formal learning absolutely and and instead of making them contradictory the formal learning and the practice knowledge build together that would be great <laughs> if, if we could do that more and there's also a question i have about the way we uh, structure our learning at the moment it's very age-based rather than necessarily the stage of learning that the student is at. Do you think that that's an issue and that, that we could benefit from changing that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I've seen small scale innovation. So in some schools, they have more stage based learning where in different subject areas, maths, you know, you might be in year five in English or language, you might be in year four or three or whatever. It's implemented a bit better than what I'm saying there. But no, I, I understand because people have different strengths and weaknesses and you allow the students to, you know, take the more advanced part in, in the things that they're strong at and yeah, exactly. work that, at the level they're at in each area, basically. There are examples of accelerated learning where some people in year 11 are doing a university course you know because mm -hmm. they're able to do that and it, it accelerates their learning but these are individual schools and individual students as a system uh, throughout the western world we are very much age-based and cohort-based and so on and that works sometimes but often it doesn't work and it, it means that people are out of kilter with the rest of the learners in their group and either they're very bored or else they're drowning, they're out of their depth and so on. Yeah. Um, again, the, the 
exceptions to that tend to be so-called alternative schools, experimental schools, you know, like, like Summerhill in the UK many decades ago, and also other, other schools uh, where they're, they're more focused on the individuals as learners first rather than being at their age determining kind of learning they should be doing. But it's a, it's a difficult issue to scale. Yeah, I, I can see that because you, you're looking at people as individuals and that's not something that's going to translate well to a wide scale system. Some high schools are 1,500 students, 1,600 students. Yeah. Uh, in terms of school size, it's really interesting, you know, that uh, previously, for instance, uh, as an efficiency measure, small school, like one teacher schools, two teacher schools, were closed because the feeling was that they're just inefficient and so on. Yeah, there's quite a bit of research, again, without idealising it, but there's quite a bit of research that says that those smaller schools, which were multi-age by definition, you know, you'd have one one kid in year one and two in year three and whatever, all working with one teacher. So for those teachers who were good at their craft, that would have been a real challenge, but one that they would relish. And the students would, as a, as a microcosm of what schooling could be like, you know, uh, peer learning going on, people at different levels, but but with, in a seamless kind of way because it's one classroom. If we had better funding for teachers, could we increase the number of teachers? Actually, that's a very, very good point because learners with autism or with particular kinds of learning difficulties, previously they would have been segregated in a special school. And the, the feeling was that should only be for a minority of learners and most of those should come in to mainstream schools. And philosophically and ethically, that's a really good move. But as is often the case, it was generally not accompanied by enough resources and so a lot of teachers say and they struggle, say would, get left behind. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I can see that that's like important for like not ostracizing anyone who have has any, you know, like autism or, or yes. any kind of learning difficulty, like because, you know, it, it's already going to be hard without, yes. you know, adding the fact that you, your peers are all labeling you as different. You don't get to actually interact with them generally. That's yeah. right. How, how do we deal with the problem of attendance and retention? So one way that we deal with that is to present it as a, a problem of regulation. And so resources are allocated to you're naughty, you're deviant because you haven't been at school for, for a certain amount of time and so on. And so that that's the approach taken in some schools. But in some schools, it's actually that's a symptom of something else that we need to look at. And, the, and in some cases, the, the young person, the school student might actually be a carer for a family member or whatever, or uh, might be needed to help out at home. Um, equally, sometimes people are truants because they're, they're getting into bad company. So again, it's a, it's a single phenomenon, but it, it, it takes different forms. I remembered what I wanted to ask. It was about um, soft skills and how current curriculums don't really focus on teaching those explicitly. They're, they're more coincidental. Do you think that there is value in a more focused effort on trying to, to teach those kind of soft skills? I do, absolutely. I, I, I put soft skills in the same basket as teaching values. And so, you know, there's a big debate about in Australia and I'm sure in other countries, what values might we see as being useful, like citizenship or community mindedness or things that actually shade into soft skills in a way, like kindness as a value uh, being demonstrated as teamwork or as empathy or those kinds of things. Yeah, of course. So I, I agree with you, Rebecca, both sets of those are really important. However, I sometimes wonder if... I think the, the most effective way for those to be learned is contextually. And what I mean by that, for instance, is say uh, with work experience for, you know, sometimes students in year 10, year 11, go out on work experience. Those can be transformative if you've got the right program, if you've got the right work experience supervisors, um, because they, they change the, the, the person's identity from being a year 10 student to being a potential future member of this firm or this community. Yeah. And the ethos 
of the of that organization becomes crucial equally the ethos of the school is crucial so as we know schools often have uh, mantras about what values they have you know respect mm -hmm. or integrity or whatever uh, and that's fine but it's it's crucial that every member of that organization of that school clearly demonstrates that they also uphold those soft schools skills and those values people regardless of how old they are but certainly school students are very good at picking up on hypocrisy and people who say do what i say don't do what i do not as don't. i do yeah exactly yeah. but i think also we have to, my view is we need to recognize they take time to develop the soft skills and so on because young people are learning who they are and it's often through conflict or through testing out relationships and so on that they find their place and their sense of who they are. Do you think that um, there is an issue with our educational system where we punish failure um, rather than accepting that as a learning opportunity? Yeah. Look, that's an excellent point. Uh, and I know some teachers who individually believe that uh, we learn by failing, trial and error. And that's how we learn naturally. But they're often going against the grain of um, external exams and that plan. And mm -hmm. The focus, sometimes excessive focus on formal assessment, leaves very little time for failing, for trying things out and they're not working and that kind of thing. So it's almost as though our schools are on a treadmill or conveyor belt, whichever metaphor we want to use, and it's heading in one direction, whereas actually what we should be doing is having some of that, well, obviously some form of learning, and testing and so we, on. We obviously need to measure, like, you know, what, be yeah. able to gauge where a student is at and, and how That's to best right. help them. But I, so, I do think that there is maybe an issue with, you know, you just get labelled with a, a grade and that, that's it. Exactly. And life is also about taking risks, isn't it? Because otherwise we become very conformist and our, our assessment system is in danger of creating people who are very good at conforming, at least outwardly. So that means that you, this you is could the say text. that you're just uh, training people to be really, really good at taking tests, <laughs> <laughs> rather That's than right. exactly yeah. yes. Whereas once they leave school, I think it's often when people are at their most vulnerable that the soft skills become really important. So you know, particularly say with a medical situation or a family member or whatever, and the people we tend to remember, say the nurses, are the people who are kind who show yeah. that they really care, that they understand, whereas the people who might have better clinical knowledge but are really quite clinical in their approach. Yeah, that, uh, that lack of bedside manner can be very off-putting. And adds to the stress and potentially makes it more difficult for the patient to recover. But where, do the, where does that empathy and care come from? It comes from within the person, but it comes from within the person in context where they're able to demonstrate that, that this is appropriate, you know, because there would be some situations where that could be frowned on. No, no, we're here for efficiency. You know, you're, yeah. you're behind with taking the medical charts or whatever. No time to talk to the patient. Do you think that there is value in finding more flexible ways for people to contribute? Like if they don't have soft skills, like people with autism, for example, tend to very much lack the, that kind of, social facility yes. um but that doesn't mean that they're not able to be quite valuable members of society absolutely and and that that goes both to the inclusive part of sdg4 and to notions around fair work and equitable work and so on uh, where people are sometimes as you say labeled and miss out on opportunities to contribute mm -hmm. and the only way that they can make those contributions is if they're encouraged and if situations are created where they're connected with others and they that's how we find out new ways to live together and that we yeah, can contribute. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been really great talking to you and very illuminative. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. And I have to say you're a delight to talk to. I have no idea. The time's gone very quickly. So <laughs> yeah, it has. <laughs> thank you for making it so easy and enjoyable. Really appreciate it. <laughs>